So thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. Round two for yeah, us. Round yeah. two. First time the audio situation just didn't work out, but this actually is episode number one in the new home studio. So thanks so and much for coming. Yeah, and this is very comfortable. We're not sitting on uh, <laughs> yeah. kick shields or whatever we were sitting on so at the gym. The, the, the Taekwondo guy who actually had a sick knockout was like sweeping the floors in the background. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a, a good experience, but this is a little bit more... Sure. Dynamic. I agree. So tell people who may not know you a little bit about your background, you, you know, before you got into the UFC and then being in the UFC and now your business as a coach, business owner, just yeah. kind of walk us through that. Yeah. Um, you know, I played a little sports when I was young, played some lacrosse, played some football, never really found a sport that I was like particularly good at, you know, or, or I guess I was always like, um, so I was I was a goon in lacrosse, right? I was I was like the guy who would go get violent. And I, okay. Yeah, and, and uh, so that that seemed to come very natural to me. Uh, was bullied as a kid, mm. right? Uh, the neighborhood I grew up in, just just constant bullying. So, um, you know, violence and fighting kind of became my way out of that. Like at the day that I chose to like stick up for myself mm. and like be physical or whatever with these bullies. Um, you know, not only did the bullying stop, but also like started getting like respect from peers or almost like um, some form of popularity. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, mm -hmm. but, um, and I think, I think you'll hear that story with a lot of fighters, you know, this like uh, where we start to find like uh, value uh, through violence. So mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy, but um, I, I think that there's two types of violent people. I think they're good good guys mm -hmm. that are violent as well right yeah. uh, and I like to think of myself as yeah. one of those but uh so you got introduced to jujitsu pretty early on there were guys this would have been like 1996 97 so there's um you know back then if anyone knew any jujitsu it was like bringing a laser gun to the old west mm. like you were just like yeah. on another level right right there was a kid that went to high school uh, with me that was a blue belt in jujitsu under a guy who had lived in Hoist Gracie's basement. Okay. So like, that's kind of how it went back then. Uh -huh. I think there were only, there were probably only two people who actually had gyms mm -hmm. in Colorado at the time. My family was poor and couldn't afford that, but I was training jujitsu with these guys who trained jujitsu. So I was getting it secondhand mm -hmm. as a teenager. As soon as I had a car and a job and I was old enough to like pay for it myself, this is around like 19 years old. Um, literally spending all my money on gas money driving across town to train with a guy named David Ruiz that mm -hmm. was a, a Machado uh, mm. affiliate. So that was when I was 19, started studying jujitsu then. That would have been uh, 1999. And then off and on, you know, through uh, my college experience, which wasn't the typical college experience. I went to the so I, I'm an artist. I went to the Art Institute in Denver, but mm -hmm. I lived in Boulder mm. on the, like right off the CU campus because mm -hmm. that's where my buddies were. Right, and that was that was uh, more, you know, financially, I, it was easier to rent a room in their house. I see. Than it was to rent my own apartment right. downtown. I mean, that, that's the reason I told my parents. Right, <laughs> you know, I, I there's also you know. Um, the lifestyle of a sure. Boulder was really fun. You know, I met a girl up there. I was like, I was in a relationship, things like that. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, didn't do jujitsu much when I was up in Boulder, but, um, as that, as that chapter ended and I got back into Denver, I was like, man, I need to get back into jujitsu. Uh, met Nathan Marquardt, mm -hmm. you know, Nate Marquardt. Yep. So met him literally right at that time. I was at some fights with a buddy watching fights and Nate was there and Nate's like, well, I have a gym. You should come in. And I went in there as a blue belt that hadn't trained in like three years. Mm -hmm. And this, this, I actually had this experience the other day. This guy comes up to me and he's like, He's like, uh, professor, what belt should I wear? I was like, oh, what fucking belt are you? <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, uh, I'm a blue belt, but you know, I haven't trained in like five years. So what belt should I wear? I was like, well, then you're a shitty blue belt. Yeah. Like that doesn't mean you, you don't get to demote yourself. <laughs> like the mat is a place of honesty. And, yeah. and I had experienced that at that time as well. Um, and then trained pretty consistently. I mean, I never stopped training after that. Right. So that would have been about 2003 or something. Okay. I think. 2003, 2004. And Nate was an MMA fighter, right? And even I loved the UFC. I was watching it uh, as a teenager mm -hmm. with my buddies. But watching the UFC back then was like, 
it was very taboo. We would get the VHS tapes. I remember. Right? We'd get the VHS tapes, and then we'd like wait for my buddy's parents to leave, and we'd like put it in and, and watch it. We'd go in the backyard yeah. and try to recreate, yeah. you know, what we were seeing Hoist do or whatever. Um, but yeah, so Nate was fighting. Nate asked me to go to Albuquerque one time. Okay. His friend Keith Jardine okay, no, was, Keith was fighting a jiu-jitsu guy. Okay. And I was a purple belt, and I was, a, I was Keith's size. He's like, you want to come down and, and train a little bit? And those guys just beat the hell out mm. of me, dude. Keith and uh, Joey Villasenor, but, but, you know, the Rashad Evans, the yeah. guys that were like the staple of Jackson's guys back then. And the drive from Albuquerque to Denver is about eight hours, right? And on that drive, I had I made up my mind. I was like, I'm quitting my job. Nice. I'm going to be a, this is all I want to do. I just want to be a fighter, you know? And then just kind of made all of that happen. Um, and how old were you at that time, 2003? Uh, would have been like 20, 2003, I was 22. Okay. Yeah, 20, 22 and ish, 22, 23, something like and that. And you said you went into, you met Nate. Nate, did he own High Alps? Did he, he did. own the gym? Okay. Yeah, he did. And it was, um. It's the same gym that I've met you at. Or no, was it a different location? It was a different location. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was, there was one mat and a boxing ring. It was very small. Okay. You know, we, I think we probably had about 30 to 60 students at okay. the time, something like that. And it was definitely geared for fighters, yeah. fighters and cops. He had, he had a pretty good, like, uh, law enforcement program. He was, te- was teaching cops how to, you know, defend themselves, sure. which I think is an honorable thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, being, being Nate's student opened up more doors for me, dude. I mean, like I got to train, I was still an amateur fighter and I was getting to do trips to Montreal to train with George St. Pierre at TriStar and got like VIP access. Wow. Dude. Straight up, man. And and then the whole Jackson experience, like, I loved fighting. I wasn't necessarily a great fighter. I tend to overthink things. And, um, you know, fighting's not a thinking man's game, you know? Agree. And so, um, but what I did get is this, like, I mean, I can't imagine a better education in coaching. I can't imagine it. I, I know I'm not saying that I got the best. I, I actually, I am. I think I got. <laughs> I think I got the best education in coaching. I really mm-hmm. did. I got to watch Greg Jackson, uh, Faraz Sahabi, mm-hmm. Trevor Whitman, uh, Amal Easton, and Elliot Marshall, who were doing our jujitsu mm-hmm. stuff back then. Christian Allen. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the list goes on and on. If I don't, if I, mm-hmm. there's lots of names that need to be added to that list. But I got to watch that look at these different styles of coaching and the different, like the ways that these guys would come about it. Lauren Landau, right. The strength, Mm -hmm. the the strength and conditioning coach that we all used all these guys, just Mm -hmm. these great minds, Leister bowling. Um, so, you know, my career was moving slow, a lot of injuries. Um, I I was almost more a professional training partner than Mm -hmm. I was like, uh, a fighter at Mm -hmm. some points. It was more lucrative to, you know, have some of these guys who were literally fighting for UFC titles uh, pay me to spar mm-hmm. than it was to go fight for 200 bucks in some, yeah. you know, crap show or yeah. whatever. But um, just about when I thought like, all right, I've reached the end of this thing. I don't know. I don't know how much further I can take it. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And I was getting that like, there was always this like hunger in my belly to, uh, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit mm-hmm. where I was like, I want to do something. I want to build something. Um you know, and I, I, I'm a spiritual guy. I was praying about it. I was like, show me, put me where you want me, wherever yeah. you want me. I'm going to tear it up, but you got to put me where you want me, you know? And then I get the call to be in the UFC. And it, I think it was a little like, it was late for me. Mm-hmm. I was very beat up at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my body wasn't holding up like it did. So my UFC career wasn't like anything to write home about. Right. I, I, I was, uh, I was in for two and a half years had a good time got to do it yeah great right i I won a bonus in australia one time with a big knockout stuff like that so it it was really fun but um when it was time to transition into coaching i was ready i I really and and was doing that already like back in the day we all coached each other too Mm -hmm. even though we had all these great coaches um they were all like in specific skill sets Mm -hmm. and there really wasn't this thing yet of like there wasn't I guess for us would have been this and I guess Greg technically too, but, um, there weren't coaches who had already done all of it, Mm. you know, that could teach it as MMA. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Instead of like going and learning wrestling, going and learning jujitsu, going and learning boxing and trying to figure out how to put it together. Um, and that, that, that's been the challenge, right? Is like, how do we, how do we go about teaching this thing 
in this new way. And I, I really, I think we do. I, th- I think that we think about MMA different than the other coaches. I've been to the UFC coaches summits where all the coaches get together at the PI and mm-hmm. talk about this stuff. And I left the first one extremely confident. I left going like, these guys are talking about shit we were talking about 10 years mm-hmm. ago. Mm-hmm. And I remember looking at my peers and I know there's a few of the coaches in that room that think about it the way we do. And, and they know who we are and we know who they are. Mm-hmm. That, and we, you know, we get to get across the cage and, and video game with those yeah. guys. You yeah. know what I mean? But, um, yeah, I think I can say that without being arrogant or yeah. whatever, that I, I think we are on the cutting edge. I think what we've done in the last few years shows it. Mm-hmm. And I think we think about MMA differently. We've, mm-hmm. we, we, we simplify it. It doesn't need to be as complicated, you know? Yeah. Combat is simple. And, and I think we we're, we're, I think we're really, especially right now, we're really getting into a, a special stride. You know? I agree. I think, uh, I would consider elevation as one of the super teams of the world. I mean, yeah. AKA elevation, um, you, the Florida ones, Sanford yep. and yep. Yeah. Yep. American and top team, American top team. Yep. Now that you guys are moving into this new gym, new facility. Yeah. I think it's going to take your brand to the next level. I hope so. Yeah. More space. Um, we need a cage again. We yeah. Need a cage, right? We, we had a cage for years. We had the muscle farm cage. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, we had the grudge cage mm-hmm. or the T's KO cage. Mm-hmm. We had the Easton training centers cage. We, we've always had a cage. And then we've done this little chapter recently without a cage. And I've noticed a few fights where it made a difference, you know? I'm sure. Cause you know, trying to get up off a wall versus a cage, a little bit different. Yeah. There's a spring system. And ring, ring control and yeah. all that. I mean, one of my favorite concepts is this concept I call the outside six, right? So me, my, the person who I coach most often with is Vinny Lopez, right? And him and I, man, we just like, we nerd out on this, bro. (laughs) And we have just created this really fun, like range based system for Uh MMA that, that are, that all of our guys use. And, and that's our thing. It's like our life's work or a piece of our life's work. Right. And a big piece of that is what happens in the outside six feet of the cage, right? So like that, there's a line literally mm, on the floor okay. in the UFC. We call that the outside six, and there are protocols for how you fight there, right? A, a hierarchy of decisions you make and things like that. Well, without a cage, you know, right. you're forced to do that on a long straight wall, and it's just not the same. It's not the same. You know, yeah. it's just not the same. Yeah. So are you guys going to get that delivered before the January 2nd start date? I actually don't know. Uh, Christ, Christian's doing the cage part. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I got all the mats. There's just like so many projects mm-hmm. to do. So we kind of broke it up in chunks. He's figuring out the cage. I was figuring out the mats. The last I heard, we're doing a floor cage and it's on the, we, there's these, there's two giant mats right mm-hmm. next to each other with a wall, like a, like a broken wall in the middle. And the cage is on the striking side because okay. it's a little bit longer than the jujitsu side. Got it. Yeah. You mentioned Christian. So I know Christian's your business partner. He yep. owns a portion of high altitude. Correct. And then he's also the head striking coach. Yeah. So are you considered the head grappling coach? Um, I think that those roles, they kind of, they, they're broken up between a few different people. Okay. Right. So like I know Christian would be the head striking coach for a handful of guys. Vinny Lopez would be a head striking coach for a handful of guys. And then there's a couple other coaches that, uh, that guys will work with, uh, um, Justin Houghton, mm-hmm. um, a, a few. So if I'm forgetting people, I, I don't mean to mm-hmm. disrespect anyone. Rich, maybe um, Rich. Falls yeah, in the yeah Rich works yeah. with a couple guys. I would say that most of what's happening in the MMA uh, with with our higher level guys is happening with a. Con- it's Christian, it's Vinny, and probably Trevor Whitman. Those would be the three guys that are having the most impact on the high level mm-hmm. guys, and then. Um, you know, Justin would be right there. Work. He's working with a bunch of up and comers and things like that. And then, you know, Rich, a bunch mm-hmm, of other guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm always fascinated by corners. Like, uh, Corey Sanhagen fought this past weekend. He yeah. had Ryan Hall, I'm assuming, kind of there for jujitsu and yep. scrambling. Yep. Carrington Banks. Yep. I'm assuming more wrestling or. Yeah. And then Christian just striking coach. So he kind of had a mixture. Yeah. How do you guys, or how does a fighter. <laughs> select their corner and what kind of goes into that thought process and then to follow up on that is it always the same corner for those fighters so i would love to say that we have a standard across the whole team for how how cornermen and coaches are are chosen but the reality is we don't right um for the guys that i work with there is a standard there's something there's like something that we we tell them this is what it needs to look like this is how 
we're going to be the most effective. Um, and that would be first seat, second seat, third seat. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking for. If they, if they're in a, a title fight or a main event fight and they get a fourth seat, it's just a training partner okay. that we bring along. So I corner the most with Vinny Lopez, right? Uh, and Vinny and I, man, we just work seamlessly in that corner. We've been doing it a long time and it basically goes like this. When the fight is on the floor, I'm voice number one. Okay. But that doesn't mean that Vinny doesn't get a voice. He's just, he's second seat. I'm first seat in that scenario. Mm -hmm. When we're wrestling on the fence and we're in, uh, you know, in wrestling moves and kind of connecting from feet to floor and things like that, um, we're almost speaking as equals and just mm -hmm. doing a really good job of not speaking over each other. And as the fight shifts to stand up or starts in stand up, Vinny's the, the number one seat I and see. I'm the number two seat. Our number three seat is whoever we bring for that fighter. It's typically a training partner because we want them to be able to drill with that mm -hmm. person throughout the week. And we that person has a specific job for us. So what they are doing is they're looking for things we're not seeing, right? Sometimes you can get tunnel vision in a fight. And they are um, echoing, but with the intentionality of like trying to say it different than what I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. So let's like, let's say I'm saying, um, hey, underhook, 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 or something like that, because I want the underhook, but the guy's clearly not listening. Then the third seat might say, pummel, mm, right? It's, it it means saying, the same yeah. thing, but it's just not registering, right? And they're, they're doing a good job of making sure that they're not talking over us. They're communicating ideas to the second seat, and then the second seat will say it. The first seat is, is engaged in the communication of what needs to happen at that minute. The second seat is doing this thing where he's echoing the, the, the first seat, with an extra emphasis on coaching the judges mm -hmm. and listening to what the third seat has. So mm -hmm. we get this really nice flow of communication when it goes right, <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, you know, some guys choose cornermen uh, for reasons that I don't understand. I don't know, you know? Yeah. There's some guys that just bring their buddies. Sometimes there's financial stuff that goes into that. I charge 5% mm -hmm. from any one of my fighters that makes more than 10 grand in the fight. And if you don't make 10 grand in the fight, then I coach you for free. Those that that's what I do, right? Just across the board. Across the board. So if you're not if you're not to the point where you're making 10 grand in your fight yet, 10 grand to show, right? Um, then I don't I don't charge you. I'm I'm just I'm your coach until you start making money, right? So is that for all coaches? So if you have three coaches, 15% or is it every coach is Yeah, different? every well so every coach at, on our team has the freedom to negotiate, right? But five is usually what we're looking at. There are scenarios where a coach has multiple jobs. So we have, we have some coaches who are like strength conditioning coaches and they're your striking coach. Um, so they got, they got to figure out how you're going to make that work. Like you might be paying a membership at their gym mm -hmm. to have access to this and this mm -hmm. and this. And then you get 5% when you, uh, when, when, I, when they corner. Um, and then the other thing that I hear is a lot of those coaches will just charge 7%. Right. So, I see. so like, I, I think that that's, I think that's reasonable, right? In that circumstance, the fighter's paying 12% to coaches, right? They're probably mm -hmm. using two coaches, they're paying 12%. And then, um, you know, and then they, I'm sure they have a manager Management, or something too. Yeah. I don't think you need three paid coaches in a corner. Um, and then what's I think that? you did back in the day when, when, when the skills were separated like that. You know, I think, I think you can get it done with two. I think, um, I, I really liked Corey's corner. He had three. Mm -hmm. I, I would assume they were paid, three paid coaches, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he had he had everything covered. There, plus like those three guys think about fighting differently. That's important too, right? You don't want to get tunnel vision in that fight. Maybe there's a different perspective that yeah. needs to be brought up, or yeah, or whatever. You know, that was Ryan's first time in the corner, so. Um, I, I, I've never watched Ryan corner. I don't know anything about his cornering abilities, yeah. right? So my hope in a situation like that, that was that he wasn't going to be overpowering, overbearing, and speak over something that's been working yeah. for years. Um, but it looked like it went really smoothly. Yeah. Ryan's smart, you know? He, yeah, he, yeah, he knows. His, I mean, exactly. when they cut to the corner in the, the, you know, between the three rounds, I don't think I saw Ryan say more than a word or two. So yeah. I think he knew. And it was mostly on the feet. Yeah. Um, but I really liked how Corey, even though he didn't get the takedowns, he just, what he did was he said, I'm just taking him down to negate the power. He just wanted to show him. And he, sure. and that song guy was so reactive to the takedown. So yeah. I think, you know, to an elementary 
vision like I have, even I was able to tell, okay, the first two takedowns, why is he doing it? Then the next three or four, I'm like, now I see why he's yeah. doing it. He's drawing a reaction. That's that's great. That's yeah. really good. I think that that's, a, that's something that gets mistaken all the time, right? Even by judges where they say, well, he's trying to wrestle, but he's not being ineffective mm -hmm. as, as though or, or as if the only purpose of a right. shot is to gain a takedown. Yeah. That's not the only purpose, right? I mean, this is one of the things that I, it, if you were a fighter mm -hmm. and you came to me and this was our first day together, mm -hmm. this would be the talk that I would give you. I would say, we're gonna level change a lot mm -hmm. and we're gonna fit in with varying degrees of effort. Sometimes we're just gonna halfway get in and mm -hmm. let them out. Sometimes we're gonna go all the way in and let them out. Sometimes we're gonna take them down and, let, and cut them up. That means score on the way up. Mm -hmm. So there's there's like levels in which I'm going to engage the takedown, but in the beginning, we're gonna have no intention of staying on the floor because mm -hmm. I'm trying to teach you a lesson and the, and the lesson is this. Imagine you and I are in a fist fight, right? And then I pull out a box cutter. Okay. <laughs> so what are you gonna do? Run. Well, maybe, right? Like you, maybe, maybe more distance. Maybe we're locked in a cage, so you can't run. So the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna step back. Yeah. Right. Well, first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna look at the box cutter. You're gonna think about the box cutter. Right. You're gonna step back. You're gonna be super picky with what you throw, meaning that the volume of what you throw goes way sure. down. You're also gonna throw way harder. You're gonna try to hit me harder because there's this like extra element of danger, right? You're gonna every time I show the knife, you're gonna take a step back maybe into the outside six, right? So the, the, we used to do this thing where, where like we wanted, to hide, we wanted to hide our wrestling. The only time that we hide our wrestling now is when we actually want to take you yeah. down, right? The rest of the time, I want to show you wrestling. Yeah. I want wrestling to be in the forefront of your mind. I want you so focused on wrestling that I can outstrike you even if you're a better striker than me, right? And, and I want... You know, I, I want I want it to dominate your entire thought process. Even if you're the one that showed up, like let's say you showed up to this fight and you were going to wrestle, right? I we want to be able to use it as this like psychological weapon to take you out of your element, to decrease the you know your volume per minute mm -hmm. with striking, to 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 really assist with where you stand in the ring, backing you up and getting you into places mm -hmm. that are more advantageous for me. Um, all of that stuff, yeah. right? And when I can get you to bite on yeah. it, and you saw Song bite on it when he did, when Corey yeah. level changed and he like fell on his yeah. face, that's when I was like, "Oh, we yeah. got him!" You know, that's what yeah, I that's it, too. man. You know, and then and then outside of that, um, you know, there's the other obvious things. It gasses their arms out. It gets them tired. Yeah. Most people, it decreases their volume. It didn't with Song. I think he's just like a, you know, he's just a meathead, bro. He just kept moving forward. One thing that Corey said in the post fight interview that I have actually experienced in sparring. It was at your gym. Uh, it was the first time I'd sparred in maybe two years. So I was already like, fuck, do I really, you know, sparring for me is still very scary. I'm sure for most people, it's still very scary. For sure. Rich was there, luckily, to control the sparring. And the first person that I got matched up with, we went light, I got warm. Second person, Rich pulled me to the side and he said, just be careful with this guy. He fought on the Jorge Masvidal's Game Bread uh, series. Mm -hmm. He's knocked out everyone. I've told him to go light with you, but just, you know, be careful. And I'm <laughs> like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I go with him and he's just, he's got this eerie look, the same look that Corey was describing for song. And I was like, I don't want to hit him because I don't want to get hit, but I had to throw something. So I threw yeah. a very stiff jab and it landed. And I was like, fuck, because he, Shit. Yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. just gave me this look like that did nothing to me. Now I'm going to walk you down. And that's what he did. He walked me down. Yep. He landed some big shots and I covered up and I was thinking, Dude, I got a wife and kids. Like, please don't knock me out. And Rich came and grabbed me. He's like, dude, take it easy. Yeah. But all that to say, it's a scary feeling when when Corey was peppering him with shots and he was still just walking him down. Yeah. But I think the takedowns, the attempts to negated that eeriness as much as possible and allowed him to cut and allowed him to win the yeah. fight. And going into the fifth round, I think it was clear that Corey's momentum was going up and Songs was going down. It's a shame we didn't get to see it. I agree. But I think inevitably it, it would have led to a finish or just put a stamp on Corey dominating that fight. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I messaged Corey right after that fight. I was just like, bro, smart. Yeah. Smart. And, and 
we've we've talked about the TJ Dillashaw fight before you and I, right? Yeah. Obviously, we both think TJ uh, that Corey won that fight, right? But, but not the I don't, contest. Yeah, but I don't think Corey won the contest. Yeah, the exactly. Contest. Because there is a. Um, we have to be realistic about about this contest that we're entering into. It's not a fight, yeah. right? Fights, real fights, the winner is determined at the end of the fight based on the entirety of the fight and based on who quits first, Yeah, right? Yeah. That's how a street fight goes, right. right? If we get in a fight right now and you beat me up for 10 minutes, but at the end I'm on top of you hitting sure. you in the face, who won the fight? I did, right? So when there's no time limits in like a real fight, it only matters what happens at the end. Yep. Nobody says, well, you had him for a yeah. second. They don't care, right? <laughs> right, right? But these things are scored five minutes at a time. Yeah. Yeah. And I would even say they're, most of these judges, I watch these judges, they're scoring at a, a minute at a time. Like they're watching like, like if I hold you on the wall for, if I hold you on the wall for a minute and you don't win the next minute, I just won two minutes because mm -hmm. you didn't, you didn't earn it back. It's like cornhole, mm. you know, like if yeah. I got a bean on the board and you don't, yeah. you know, that kind of thing, right? So- that's what happened in the TJ fight, yeah. right? Is that is that, and you know, kudos to TJ because TJ got the fuck beat out of him. His, no, Knees, his knee was blown yeah. out, all cut Massive up, cut, all yeah. all jacked up, and still had the wherewithal to, to grind out like the rules, right? Like, right. all right, I'm gonna, I gotta win it in the judge's yeah. eyes, you yeah. know. So uh, I think that was one of the best things that ever happened to Corey, and I think that you know I, I've told him that before, and I think that he's, I think you see it, you saw it in his last fight. Yeah, like he's he's uh, playing the game. Yeah, because dude, if a guy that fights as well as him plays the game as well as TJ, you know, that's a goat. Like that's yeah. that's like a definition Absolutely. of a goat. You know, yeah. yeah. Who do you see him fighting next? Do you, Cheeto or Marab? I think that'd be cool. Yeah, yeah, that'd be real cool. Funny story. So I flew to California a couple of weeks ago for business. I took my family with me just so my parents could see the, the, their grandkids. You know, flying with kids is a, always a shit show. So we get out of John Wayne Airport. I yeah. got one kid here pushing the stroller. Who do I see right in front of me? Cheeto Vera. Yeah. I'm like, Cheeto with a kid in my hand. And he's like, he's very nice and, and yeah. humble. I'm like, nice to meet you, man. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I have a podcast. I'd love you to, to be on it. He yeah. said, for sure, man. Just let me know. Hell and we yeah. Kinda, we kind of just went our different ways. But that would be awesome if Cheeto comes on the podcast, Corey comes on the podcast, and that'd they duke it out. Yeah, that'd That's going to cool. be a beautiful be stand-up so cool. fight. I like that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was very sweet. I had, he fought in San Diego. Yeah, uh, recently, and I had somebody on that card, and you know, I, after the fight, I was uh, sitting on the patio at the hotel by myself, having a tequila, just like yeah. you know, chilling out. Yeah. And I was watching him with his family and his friends, like celebrating, and yeah, it was special. Yeah. Uh, yeah As cool. a family man yourself, do you do you now that you've got kids and a wife and settled down, do you gravitate more towards seeing that and and embracing it than you yeah. did probably yeah same yeah. here yeah it was wild i'm sure you know we all were wilder when yeah. we were young but i was wild i think i in what way partying yeah, yeah. well I, I mean not not dr not drugs mm -hmm. but um uh, i i was i've always been a drinker i probably mm -hmm. you know in high school started going to parties and drinking and stuff like that um I've always, you know, you know, the, the guys that like don't know when it's out of control. So I always was blessed with like, I could always tell like in college and everything, like if, if we were drinking too much, I could always be like, ah, this is a problem. This is a problem for me. Yeah. That kind of thing. So I don't think it ever got out of control, but, um, you know, I was wild, you know, uh, getting in street fights, <laughs> you know, um, all that kind of stuff. And. As you get older, that naturally turns off, I think. But when you have kids or when you meet a good woman, sure. right? When I, when I met my wife, um, you know, they just bring that out of you. It's like my wife, you know, there was like this unspoken thing like, well, this ain't going to happen unless you get your shit together. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and I needed that. Mm -hmm. And then kids is just a whole different animal, man. When I, when I saw my daughter for the first time, what a, what a shocking experience. You know, you, it's like getting hit by this like, this giant boulder made out of love just rolls you flat and just crushes you. And you're just like, all right, well, like, this is it. This is everything I do moving forward is for this, you yeah. know? And, um, I have two daughters and a son and, you know, 
they're just they're the whole world to me. Yeah, yeah. I, even, yeah, I see know. your stories of your son and your, and your daughters, and it warms my heart. I love it. It's yeah. Best, yeah, it's kind of. I'm funny. sure people don't like watching videos of my daughter in my car walking <laughs> to school, but I, I do shit, it. man. I I, that's it, what man. I'm into. You yeah, know? no, I'm the same way. I yeah. love it. Um, it's funny that like, talking about that flight. Like I was the person very similar to you. It was kind of wild before I got married and had kids. Um, and I'd be on the flights and listening to a kid scream, and I'd be like, "Dude, shut that kid yep. up!" Yep. And now I'm just like, "Poor kid, poor parents." Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I know what. Yeah, I know what they're yeah. going through. Things change. Yeah, man. You, 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 yeah. You hear that kid screaming now? Like, I, I try to do this as often as possible. When I see a mom dealing with a difficult kid, like at the end of the flight or something like that, I'll, I'll you know, I'll be like, "Hey, you're doing a good job." Yeah, you know that kind of thing. Like, I want to like give her some support. Yeah. you know, and. Cause that shit's rough, man. It's, hard. it's sometimes harder for the parents than it is the kid on yeah. those flights, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the kid's frustrated, man. They're not. <laughs> yeah. You're, you put, you're putting them in a seat for hours <laughs> and saying, don't move, don't do anything or put a mask on, you know? And they're like, Wild. you know, it's just, yeah. it's just madness, you know? Yeah. Now yeah. your wife is also involved in the business. Is she not? Yeah, she is. She in handles... last few years she has been. Okay. Yeah. So how do you guys differentiate the the roles in the business you your wife christian do you guys yeah. sit down do you have like a team how does that work well so a lot of it was just kind of built out of necessity mm -hmm. right like we we started this thing and kind of i worked for nate you know christian and i came up with some money bought nate out we i think probably 100 memberships or so okay maybe, maybe less and then we just started building this thing the main the main thing where it's separated is Christian handles striking and I handle jujitsu. Okay. Now there's crossover, but like those are kind of our areas, right? And then I would say for a long time I handled everything involved in the youth program, mm -hmm. but I've delegated that, right? And then we have a front desk area and our front desk area, you know, which is uh, everything that that entails, like the all of the customer service of like um, dealing with the members we have, new student acquisition, all this stuff. Uh, I was doing that for a long time too. So for for a while, I kind of was, you know, had a lot a, of hats. Just a lot of hats, and and it, it was exhausting. We've uh, we've adopted this model where we have a department head for each one of our departments. Okay. Right? So uh, Rich is the department head for our striking program. Okay. Right? So he works directly under Christian. Uh, we have a guy named Aaron White that is the department head for the jujitsu program. Okay. He works directly under me. We have the Salisbury brothers. Do you know the Salisburys? They're twins. So they, no. they run youth the youth program, striking and, and uh, jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And then we have a department head for the front desk whose name is Jose, right? So those guys meet every two weeks. Those guys get together and meet with me and we talk about, you know, we have like a structure to a okay. meeting where we're like, you know, they, they, they each check in. They talk about challenges and successes. They talk about uh, new business, old business. They have a staff highlight. They'll usually bring up like a problem member, you know, think whatever. Like we kind of help each other solve these problems and try to keep this thing moving in the same direction. Um, and that's difficult. I mean, we have, you know, like 700, well, I think we have 650 paying members right now, plus another 250 people who are, who are there training they're just like they're in different wow. capacities right so this is it's a lot of people and then um, i'm fascinated by the business side of running a gym yeah 650 members whatever membership cost that is per month you guys have obviously very good consistent revenue coming in yeah when you purchased the book the, the business how did you value it and how would you could potentially value it now is it based off a of multiple off of the revenue yeah that's tough um because I'm assuming if you went from 100, yeah. just for those who, who may not understand, when you buy a business, you generally base it off of the multiple of the, the EBITDA, the earnings before, after, before taxes, uh, amortization, deductions, all that stuff. Yeah. The higher your revenue, the higher the multiple. Yep. So generally, if you go from 100 to 700, it's, you're not 7xing the, the value of your business. You could be 20xing it. Right. So have you, have you thought about that? I mean, I mean, I haven't thought about what the... I haven't thought about what the business is worth now. Mm -hmm. I um, and I don't. I don't think that I would know. I wouldn't even know where to start with that evaluation. You know, um, you know, I would yeah, seek someone. Yeah, I would come to somebody <laughs> like you and be like, "Yo, bro, help right. me, help me figure this thing out." Um, when we figured out the what what we thought it was worth back then, we were just basing it off of like how much money it made. Yeah, right? of we, were, we were we were like, "All right, man. Well, you know, you because Nate." 
had a different idea, obviously. He's like, look, this is what I put into it. And I'm yeah. like, well, I don't care what you put yeah, into yeah. it. I care about what I'm going to get yeah, out of it. Yeah, the seller and buyer always have yeah. that to and, 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 th- and that was tough on our friendship, man. We went, we had to go back and forth a little bit. and uh, But we got through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got through it. And, and I think I think it was fair for all parties. Nice. Uh, and then, you know, and then moving forward, you know, one of the th- one of my criticisms, I'm going to... You know, I love Nate Marquardt. So anything I say, hopefully, sure. if Nate ever watches this, I love you, bro. <laughs> um, uh, my, one of my criticisms was that they didn't put back into the business. You know, um, I, I I had a really bad shoulder surgery when I was still fighting, and I was asked to step in like GM the business, and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I like learned on the job, and I was always I would like look at the checking account, and, there were, and I would I was always like, dude, how are we going to pay rent? How are we going to pay payroll? I was like always stressed about that because money was like leaving. You know, it's their money; they yeah. can do whatever they want with sure. it, right? But but so one of the first things that I said was, I want to make sure I want to know what it costs me on average to run the business for a month, right? Well, like well, how much does it cost to run it for a month? And I want to have that times three in the check in the checking account at all times, okay. and it's never going to drop below that. And, and I don't even know, like nobody taught me that. I was just like, if I have that, then I can at least like chill out. Right. right. Yeah. So that was the first step. And then obviously what it cost to run the business was constantly going. Up. <laughs> <laughs> so that number kept going up. So for a long time, Christian and I didn't, we didn't get any profit shares. I mean, that wasn't a thing. Like the, there wasn't a thing, right? We just like worked at the gym. Like we had to pay ourselves to teach classes. We were getting paid just like any other employee there. And that was, that's how this thing started. But then as it goes, you know, uh, sure. things get better. And, and, and you get to a point where you get smarter. You learn, you learn how to manage the books better. And you learn how to like, I mean, in the beginning, I didn't even know what was a reason. I mean, I, it was, I didn't know so much. So I didn't know like, I didn't know what my payroll should be in comparison to my gross revenue. I didn't know. I didn't know any of these things, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and then I would just ask questions. A lot of like people that were more experienced than me and had done this. Well, yeah. So we talked about this on our first attempt at the podcast. It's the jujitsu mindset, right? It, um, recently, I was having issues with knee shield. You know, knee shield. So I'm in half guard, yeah, and their yeah. their knee is on my chest, yeah. or a low knee shield, which is called Z guard. And, and I'm getting stuck and I'm not passing. So I know, I know for a fact that I already learned an answer to this, but I also know that in my studies and other stuff, somehow I forgot it and now I'm getting stuck again. So what did I do? I asked one of my buddies mm-hmm. who's really good there. like, bro, what are you doing to keep me stuck here? Let me see this. And I played with him a little bit and I was like, oh yeah, I used to do this. And I started doing that. And then I got online and I was like, man, who's got a good, uh, who's got a good series on defeating this knee shield, right? bought it, watched the whole mm. thing. Oh yeah, I used to do that. I used to do that. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. Ooh, I never thought of that. I need to drill this. And then I drill it, right? And then Monday, I was rolling and I had dealt with some knee shields and I blew right through mm. them, right? So it's, it's just yeah. the same thing. So I'll be like, well, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. The four levels of learning, right? <laughs> and we do this in jujitsu. We say level one is uh, unconscious incompetence. You don't know what you, you don't, know. I don't even know. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Right. So as soon as you get to, as soon as you start, you're already at level two. That's the good <laughs> news, right? It's like, Oh, now I'm aware that I don't understand this, right? Uh, conscious incompetence. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you drill it and you practice it. And when you're totally focused on it, you can pull it off and that's conscious competence. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you reach unconscious competence, meaning that I don't have to even think, think. about this thing. I can just do it. Right. Um, and I, I don't know if I really believe in, in level four mm-hmm. unconscious competence, especially in fighting. Cause there's so many variables and, and you always have to be conscious of what's happening because the game's changing, but you'd like to have unconscious competence in a fight mm-hmm. like Corey did in his yeah. last fight where yeah. you're just, where your mind is just clear and you're just attacking and reacting and you're not thinking. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm sorry. Back to the question. No so I think I got to that place in, in some aspects of the business. Right with help, mm-hmm. um, guys that I would credit, I would credit the most help to Mike Tusignot. Mm-hmm. He's the president of Easton training centers. Um, the, the, the tricks and things that I've learned from that guy, a couple other like, uh, Joe Ban, David Dill. These were like, you know, business advisors of mine, just basically like, like I, I've collected a lot of good mentors mm-hmm. throughout my life. And these were just mentors that helped me through different decisions and helped me look at things from different angles. Um, 
Christian Allen, right? Christian doesn't have like business experience either, but we do think about things differently. So when I think that there's an answer and he'll be like, oh, well actually what about this? And then I'm like, oh shit, mm. you know? And like, so there's him and him and I are kind of like a yin yang and there's a lot of, a lot of really cool, uh, things that we teach each other just by thinking of mm -hmm. it differently. Um, but most of, most of what I learned about the gym business, I learned attending leadership meetings with the other leaders of Easton Training Center's locations, right? Now, we're no longer like an official affiliate of Easton Training Center's. The businesses grew to the point where like, it just, you know, sure. we're in competition with each other, yeah. whether we like it or not, right? And, and it, it, it got to a point where, where it was time to like make that actual separation. But the gratitude that I have, the education that I got from them, um, from Amal, from Mike, from Elliot, uh, you know, was priceless. My, nice. my family has benefited so much from nice. that. My students have, um, whether that just be like the, the X's and O's of like, uh, reports and what numbers should I be tracking? Right. What, what, you know, what, what are the important numbers? How do I, how do I handle my sales funnel? How do I, how do I take a, turn a student that's like, Hey, I'm interested in jujitsu into a member that's been training there for 10 years. Cause that's a complicated thing. Yeah. How do we do that? Right. right? Um, how do you look at this huge mess of like the gym, this uncontrollable beast, right? And how do you, wh what, what order do you need to put these lenses in to get a clear picture of exactly what is happening in your gym? Mm -hmm. Those are all lessons that I scored from those guys. And, uh, and I would like to think that I've expanded on them and I have my own ideas and they've evolved and things like that. Um, but yeah, you know. And, and studying so, yeah, <laughs> yeah and i think i mean i've been to your gym numerous times i think it's a for for the space it's a very well-oiled machine you know yeah. you have your kids classes you've got a little bit of separation in the rooms mm -hmm. striking and uh i always feel at home but i mean ian who's producing the podcast has never really gone to a gym and he, he was it was a little overwhelming for you at first right just being in a gym yeah um i mean it was certainly interesting just because you know i i'm not completely out of shape but I'm, I'm fairly out of shape I don't <laughs> exercise all too often um, and just seeing people like my size who were obviously able to throw me around like a toy was just pretty pretty wild especially watching some of the sparring happen yep. um, and it's just it, it's amazing what people can do when you're when you're just on that grind yeah. yeah yeah when you just train everybody always says to me I want to train but I need to get in shape first you're like, bro, uh, <laughs> how long is that going to take? Right. We're going to be some, if you follow that train of thought someday, you're going to be on your deathbed going, damn, I wish I would have trained. Yeah. Like you get in shape from, I'm not in great shape right yeah. now. I mean, I'm in way better shape than like regular people. Right. 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 right? But I'm not a regular person yeah, yeah. and I don't even like, I, I don't even think of myself as a regular person. Yeah. So for the type of people that I'm like for my peer group, I'm not in great yeah, shape. Right. And you just got to figure out what you are. And Oftentimes that means you get to change your peer group, <laughs> you know, like it's going to change as you go. Right. Uh, if you're in the gym business, I would say this, when you're looking at that thing, when you walk into that room and it seems all crazy, this was one of the most valuable lessons I learned. And I'll, I would just say this real quick. Um, you want to look at your gym through four lenses. I think we talked about this once before. And it's like, like you're at the eye doctor and they put the lenses mm -hmm. down and boop, there's that clear picture, right? So for the gym business or Potentially, I haven't really thought about it, but maybe other service-based businesses, it needs to go like this. The most important thing that you should focus on is your culture above all else. It needs to be a place where people want to be, where people feel safe. Um, you know, my, my culture is a petting zoo full of lions and bears, right? <laughs> That's what I want. That's what I want, man. I want monsters in the petting zoo safe monsters Amazing. right cartoon lions right where like that guy's scary and nice yes. you know like that kind of thing right um and there's a lot more to it than that but culture culture is super super important you need to define what does your ideal culture look like and you need to make sure that you are like constantly focusing on on your culture um and there are aspects of the culture at high altitude that i'm not a fan of right and sometimes i have to just accept like well, this is a this is an aspect of the culture that the students are a fan of, right? Like high altitude's a little more edgy than the rest of the gyms. Like we're in Aurora, you yeah, know, yeah. and that edginess scares me, but it's it's who we are, yeah. and, I, and I I have to accept some of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, after culture is product, 
you, your product better be world class, right? Mm -hmm. My product is world class martial arts taught by qualified, knowledgeable instructors, people who know how to teach, and these people have an ability to entertain you. That's the product. I need three things. You, it's called stage presence, teaching ability, and martial arts knowledge, right? I need those three things. That's my that's my product. So after a culture, we're making sure our product is dialed in. When those two things are dialed in, the next thing we're looking at is like our staff development. Can my staff handle the amount of students I currently have, right? Can And, and can we handle growth? And, and you can, I mean, obviously that applies to a million things. Assistant instructors, mm. instructors, the runners that are running around grabbing gear and walking people into class, the, the uh, marketing team, mm -hmm. I mean, not mar let's not go to marketing yet, but the front desk team and all of that stuff, right? So can't, uh, does my team operate? The operation of my business, what does that look like? And is my, is my team trained? Do they understand what their job is? All mm -hmm. of that, right? And then the, if all of that shit is in line, then you need a solid marketing program, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But gym owners, this is what you guys normally do. You focus 100% on your product and marketing. You throw culture out mm -hmm. the door, right? Your, your instructor's an asshole yeah. and uh, has, a, has a giant ego and doesn't give a shit or is hurting people or whatever, but he's got good jujitsu, yeah. right? We see this in a million Brazilian schools. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not picking on the Brazilians, but I've been to some of these schools, right? Uh, and they got a good marketing program, man. There's a, there's a little flyer everywhere you look and everybody knows about their gym, but anyone that shows up there, the, the coach is late. There's no, uh, there's no check-in system. There's no, there's no customer service. You just listen to really good jujitsu, get your ass kicked yeah. and go home and think about all the things that you wish your gym was doing. Yeah. And then you come visit me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, or, or any of the schools that understand this system. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's what it comes and down to. I, I think anyone who's even thinking of joining a gym, I mean, if you're here in Denver, I can't speak highly enough about your gym. You are very welcoming. Someone who's never done any sort of martial arts can walk into your gym. The front desk person will greet them. Yeah. How are you? What can I help yeah. you with? You've got very good customer service. Yeah. The quality of the coaches is amazing. Yeah. I would just say for anyone, and I'll look into the camera and say this, anyone who's thinking of joining a gym, it's a safe environment. It's going to teach you so much more than just martial arts. It's going to teach you about yourself. It's going to teach you about respect. It's going to teach you about discipline. So I urge those who may be on the fence, and I know many people have reached out to me and have wanted to join martial arts, whether it's striking or wrestling or jujitsu or MMA, it, it, that's not as important as just getting into the gym. You'll find what you love and the rest it will be history. I mean, yeah. everyone who I've introduced to martial arts, yeah. It loves it. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm exhibit A of it literally changing my life. I've got yeah. a whole podcast associated with fighting yeah. um, and finance, uh, which I want to talk to you about now as well, about yeah. the business side of things. So sure, I'm always looking at business opportunities. The businesses that I buy fall into finance categories. So I'm buying retiring financial advisors, books of business. It makes a lot of sense to me. But let's say I wanted to diversify into something that let's just call it a gym. Sure. Um, do you think a silent owner or just someone who's putting in the capital can come to you and say, hey, I know that maybe in South Denver where we are, there's no real big gyms. Yeah. I'm willing to put up the money. I need you to do everything else and let's see if it could be profitable. Do you think that that model would work or does it need the, the, the owner there running it and making sure that nothing's falling through the cracks? From my experience, uh, I mean, money up front, investors can be, that can be a great thing yeah. uh, for sure. But um, the, because of the culture part, we talked about how, mm -hmm. how important culture is, the person running that place uh, has got to be dialed in, mm -hmm. you know, has to understand all of that. I think the issue you're always going to have with martial arts gyms is bench strength. Right, like bench strength. Bench strength. Bench strength. So, like uh, instructors. Oh, okay. Qualified instructors, right? Because the world's not full of people who understand martial right, arts, and, right. and 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 a lot of the people who understand martial arts are very dysfunctional. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, there's not. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's why every gym owner I know, every uh, my department heads, when my department heads check in at our uh, our meeting every other week most of our issues are around bench strength. Mm. And we have an attitude about that. We know our attitude is like, this is a bench strength issue. These are never going to go away. Now, knowing that, how do we solve this one? They never go away, right? So 
let's say you put up money right now and you're like, dude, let's go open a gym in this area. This gym's going to crush it. That's going to be our first problem is bench I'm going to be strength. like, okay, what are we going to do for bench strength? Right. Because all my best people work for me. Yeah. You, you yeah, know what I'm yeah. saying? And I'm at the point right now where I'm building the people who are going to do the next location and stuff. That is certainly on my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, that's, a, that's going to be a really tough one. And then even once it gets going, um, I'm assuming that there'd be like a partnership or something mm-hmm. like that. Like if you don't know anything about the gym business, you're going to have a tough time running a gym. I yeah, mean, I would think like yeah. for your for your model, maybe franchising high altitude martial arts and yeah. having a small school yeah. with like, it could maybe a hundred people, but just in a, like I've noticed here where I live, there's no quality gyms for jujitsu. There's like these kids class. So mm-hmm. when you open your new gym, I'm going to take my daughter and we're going to go to the, the, the four year old yeah. jujitsu class. But let's say I didn't want to drive that 20 minutes. Sure. But if there was a high altitude five minutes away from me, like as a satellite school, yep. but it would require one of your teachers to leave the main school and go start this. Is that me that's vibrating? I'm sorry. I think oh, it's you. Yeah, you could just end the call. No My bad. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the goal, yeah. right? So uh, what one of the things that, that I'm thinking about a lot is that like, I, I know that I didn't want to have a real job. I wanted to have a martial arts job. Mm -hmm. And now I got 30 people or more that work for me that have that same dream, Mm. you know? Yeah. So, so I'm constantly thinking about how do I help them make their dream come true without me like losing out. Right. Cause like, let's say I got a guy right now that was like, coach, I'm ready to open my own gym. And I'm like, that's awesome but you're such a pivotal part of this yeah, business. Go. That that's going to crush me, man. Um, that's, that's a real thing. So I, I think, I think we're constantly moving towards that where it's like, um, my guys are training their replacements, right? So that we constantly have this bench strength thing that's moving forward because I love the, the idea of them having their own gym. Now, the idea that I like even better is if they have their own gym that I'm a partner in and then maybe there's a financial partner as well, mm-hmm. like a silent partner, mm-hmm. you know, and then, then they're in a partnership and they have, and maybe they have a few of those as, mm-hmm. as we keep thinking and as we keep growing, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, I think that's the way it makes sense for me. Um, because Money's cool. Mm-hmm. Corey, do you see the post Corey just did after? Yeah, his, uh, but, but family's, but family's cooler. cooler. And I, I read that and it put tears in my eyes. Beautiful. And, that, and that's how I feel. And I have a family right now with 700 people in it, you know, or with 30, mm-hmm. my employees, man, my, my, my instructors, all, all the people who work for me. And I, my, my drive would be to take care of them and their dreams more than it would be to, uh, bring in a partner in an area that does that, does that yeah, make sense? For sure. I've always been about chasing, uh, like what I'm passionate about and what feels right more so than just like making more money yeah. or I don't no, know. I does that it. make sense? Yeah, of course. But, um, I don't, I don't I guess I'm not really, I'm dodging the question, I guess. Um, yes, it could be done. So yeah. it would be done like this. I would say, I would say, all right, here's the deal. We've, we found a city where we think a gym would do well. Uh, we have a guy who wants to come in and help build this thing out and is going to put up the money. So we know that we can, you know, get this thing started and now it's time to find the key people. So I would look through my people and I would say, Oh, all right. Who, you know, uh, and maybe, maybe it's like they work, they spend half the week there and half the week at the current location. And I would have to scale it in a way that I was comfortable with, but this is a bridge that we, we will be crossing soon. I mean, this is like on my mind all the time. Right. So how do we do it? I've watched the Easton Jiu Jitsu guys do it really well. How do they do it? What's their model? Um, You know, from what I can see, it basically goes like this. Uh, A person that, that, that learns the aspects of the gym, works their way into a position to be like a general manager. Mm -hmm. And eventually they're managing a location, which um, I don't, I don't get to, I don't know what, the, what these guys get paid, but they, I think that they, it's a, they have a good job, right? And, and, and they all look like they love their job. So they're, they have worked their way up to basically running their own location. And then I also see uh, a lot of these people ending up, uh, you know, owning uh, portions of these locations and stuff as yeah. they move forward. And I don't know the exact model because I, I wasn't part of that, but it looks like a lot of happy employees that yeah. are getting taken care of to me. And that's, um, I've always looked at that and been like, damn, man, I love the way they're doing yeah. that. You know, like the, the people who work hard and are loyal to them are rewarded with like, uh, you know, 
more responsibilities right. and eventually like, you know, the sharing of ownerships of various locations and things like that. And that's, I think that's a really cool thing. I, I, I do know this. I'm never going to give up any percentages of high altitude mm-hmm. to yeah. anyone that that's Christian and I's yeah. thing. And, and, and we do that, but, but future locations, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Franchise. Yeah. I think yeah. that's probably yeah. the best way to do you incentivize whoever is starting that from high, from your main location yeah. to stay within the franchise, help build it, maybe yeah. give them a, a sliver of ownership, or I can talk to you about other ways. We call them uh, golden handcuffs in yeah. our world where you yeah, essentially- Yeah, I know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You essentially create either an executive, non-qualified deferred comp package, so you lock them in for 10 years. You say, listen, I, I you're very valuable to me. I wanna make sure that you don't leave me or yeah. You know, you're you're that valuable to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this executive bonus package yeah. that will pay you for the next 10 years. Yeah. But you don't get it until the 10 years are up. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes, that makes the, sense. Yeah. And I know nothing about all of that. Right. I'm like, uh, I've literally just been. I've just been. Yeah. figuring it out, man. You know, yeah. like, I'm, I've just been cowboying this thing the yeah. whole way. And like, I'm kind of talking down on myself. Like I know I've done a really good job, You have, yeah. but, but I, but I am just doing it like a cowboy, man. Yeah. I'm just figuring it out. And like, you know, yeah. All right. Well, how do we solve this? Call Christian. Yo, man, what do you think? Call some of my buddies yeah. from the other gyms. Yeah. Hey man, did you ever run into this? What'd you do? How'd you yeah. handle it? And just like, yeah, you just, but I am I'm I'm super interested in in what future locations look like. I know right now that I have guys and gals on staff that would like to have their own gym someday, and I want them to have that. Beautiful. And I want them to have that in a way that doesn't like, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt me. I think it can be so successful. So I beautiful. think so too. Yeah. You know, like if you look at the old school gym, the old school way that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academies worked. Uh, your teacher was like, you are not allowed to train anywhere else. You train here. If I find out you're at a different location, like they were so scared Mm -hmm. to let people like cross train. I love cross training. I let, I tell my students, man, you go wherever you want. Right. And if you get there and you're actually happier there and that's a better fit for you, then I want you to train there with no, with no bad blood. Like, yeah, man, you're you're good, dude. Right. Cause like, I don't own jujitsu. (laughs) You know, jujitsu is this like, like, did you see the ADCC yeah. championships last week? And did you see how big and how it got awesome? Huge. I mean, what the hell, man? Gordon Ryan's like, probably the, the main reason for yeah. that, but still, it's growing crazy. Dude, jujitsu is an unstoppable force. Yeah. And I, I tell people that all the time. I'm like, you should do jujitsu. Like, you don't, I say that so much. You know what, dude? You should do jujitsu. That's my answer to like everything. Well, where? I don't know. The closest school to your house. Yeah. The closest school to your house is where you should go. And, and if that school sucks, find the closest Easton's because I know yeah. they're going to do it well. Yeah. And obviously, I'd like you to come to my gym yeah. if you live close enough, yeah. you know, and like, because it will, it will change 100%. your life. Yeah, and Guaranteed. I don't, I don't own jujitsu, bro. And uh, so if my students want to go train somewhere else, go train somewhere else. If my employees want to cross train and do all that, I tell them to. I, I actually ask them to, right? And someday... Someday they're going to want to open their own gym. And I hope that it's like with love like that, where it's like, okay, well, let me, let me, let me, let me show you how we do it. Let me, let me help you. Right. And I'm, I'm not going to help you for free. Yeah, of course. I'm not going to help you for free, but, but that's okay. Yeah. Right. Let me help you. Let me show you yeah. how we do this. And, um, I think that's what it looks like. I don't know. I haven't crossed the bridge yet, but I'm like, it's on my mind, dude. I, I, I mean, I'm probably going to hire you to coach me through it. <laughs> that's what I we're going to do. I can help you with certain parts of it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the thing I love about martial arts or jujitsu or striking is you can use the word guarantee. Like in my world, when I'm pitching an investment to a client, yeah. I can never say this is guaranteed to make you money. Just it's not part of our vocabulary. Yeah. There's always risk. Yeah. But with jujitsu, I can guarantee you that it will improve your life. Yes. I've never met anyone who's entered a jujitsu class, done it consistently, devoted themselves to it, and two months in be like, you know, that was a big fucking waste of time. Yeah. It just does not happen. Yeah. Um, and it also teaches you what you're just explaining. Jujitsu or, or for me, it was striking or just a little bit of grappling and mostly striking. But I was starting my business the same exact time that I was starting martial arts. Yeah. And starting a business from scratch, you know, it, it, it was a lot. I was wearing multiple hats. I was overwhelmed all while still continuing to grow and market and this and that. If it wasn't for martial arts that just kind of grounded me and said, okay, let's 
attack this first, move on from this to that. I don't know if I would have been as successful. So I think yeah. other people should, and I urge them to go out and, and start training. Bro, I agree. Yeah. And yeah. if you're in the Denver area, high altitude martial arts. <laughs> come see me. Yeah. 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 Come see me. Awesome, man. For, I mean... Thanks again for for joining the second time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, when bro. your when your yeah, new bro. gym is open, I will be there January second. I'd like to uh, bring my daughter in and get some get some roles in. I would love that, and I have a bunch of uh, very interesting fighters that I would love to come uh, have sit down and talk with you. I would love that as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks again. Yeah, bro. Bye bye, everybody. Boom. Cool, man. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Sweet. So, how did it? Uh, did the